to have Dominic and Gloria back from Italy. Welcome back, guys. We're in our Bibles. Uh, if you have them, please open them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 14 through to the end. Uh, yeah, right through to the end of the chapter. We'll go right through to verse 31. If you're able to, please stand for the public reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more perishable members, presentable members, pardon me, have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor or to that member which lacked, so there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues or languages. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. A loving Father, we thank you again for this body we have here at Glenridge Bible Church with Christ Jesus as the head. We thank you again for our collective experience, that wonderful truth that each of us here, I pray, can point to a moment in our lives where we trusted, confessed with our mouths, believed in our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord, and was raised from the dead. I pray that salvation is true of each of us, that each of us here are part of this precious body of the church. We pray now that you'd bless the public reading of it, We want to pray for those who are part of this body or unable to be with us for whatever reason, whether they are at home, whether they are shut-ins, whether they are working, whether they are in the hospital. Lord, we pray your blessing upon them and that they would remember that they too, though separated physically, are spiritually part of this body of believers at Glenridge Bible Church. We pray Christ be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. We're continuing this little series on the church, and one of the themes that Paul stresses throughout his epistles is that of unity, unity in the body. It's one of the most clear exhortations found in the New Testament. It was the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was one of the great desires of the Apostle Paul's heart, echoed that of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, that God's people would be united, be of one accord, one mind, one heart, one spirit, under the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ so tightly knit in our common salvation in Jesus Christ that the metaphor that Paul uses is that of the human body. The genuine and godly desire of unity in the church today is presented in many of his spirit-inspired epistles. Ephesians chapter four, verses one to 16, is another great example of this desire, this picture of the gifts, our lives intertwined and interdependent upon one another. In that text, Paul challenges the Ephesian church to walk worthy of the gospel, to live out their faith, James would say, 
explaining in detail all that God did for both the apostle and the Ephesians. And challenges to walk worthy of the gospel individually and corporately. Not so that God will love us, not as a works type salvation, but because he does love us. So live this redeemed life, motivated by that love, anchored in the salvific work of Jesus. Carry yourself accordingly. And then he goes on to describe the importance of that said issue of unity and esteeming others, recognizing our interdependency. And that can only be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. We can't do it ourselves. We cannot achieve unity in ourselves. We have to recognize the Spirit's power to establish that unity and preserve that work in each and every one of us. Charles Spurgeon said some things about what unity isn't, what it is not, and sometimes that helps me contrast the what it isn't with what it is. So this is what it is not, according to Charles Spurgeon. It does not say, quote, to endeavor to maintain the unity of evil, the unity of superstition, or the unity of spiritual tyranny, end quote. He goes on to say it does not, quote, endeavoring to keep up your ecclesiastical arrangements for centralization, end quote. And then the Prince of Preachers says this, quote, endeavoring to keep the uni uniformity of the Spirit, end quote. That is what it does not say. Practically speaking, Spurgeon said this is what it is. If I come across a man in whom there is the Spirit of Christ, I must love him. And if I did not, I should prove I was not in the unity at all. End quote. So that's what it should look like. We would use terms like one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one father, one baptism by one spirit and one savior who is the lover of our souls. And that's where Paul begins in verses 13 to 14. 13 we looked at last week and it carries on into verse 14. Each and every one of us who call Jesus Lord and know we are saved by his person and his work alone on the cross, we have each had a divine encounter with the Holy Spirit at some point in our lives. Our, as I referred to last week, our Damascus road, so to speak. When Paul gives his defense before King Agrippa, he says this in chapter 26 of Acts. So then, speaking of his former life, so then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons having received authority from the chief priests, but also, listen closely, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. He voted for Christians to be killed. That was Saul of Tarsus. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, to deny Christ. And being furiously enraged at them, kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, as high and lofty position as the persecutor of the church, at midday, O King Agrippa, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goats? And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he goes on to say, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance, going on to say that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Do you have a testimony? Have you encountered the living Christ because that's where it begins and ends for the church? 
If you are here this morning and you have never accepted Christ, the Apostle Paul would say to you, today is the day of salvation. Why put off to tomorrow when there is no guarantee of tomorrow coming? The security, the, the knowledge of forgiveness, the, the, to know that your hope is, is anchored in Jesus of Nazareth who was once dead and is now alive. Today is that day. Well, maybe you've been walking with the Lord for many years. Well, then the balance of this message is for us. As we traveled our Damascus road, the same spirit that convicted Saul of Tarsus and transformed his life and myself and brought me to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is, that same spirit who has the power to produce unity in the church is the same one who convicted you of the same things. That same Holy Spirit that supernaturally baptized Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, and baptized me and immersed me in the person of Jesus Christ is the same Holy Spirit that supernaturally baptized you upon your confession of faith into the person of Jesus Christ. The same Holy Spirit that regenerated Paul and me and you no matter your socioeconomic or ethnic background, whether you're Jew or Greek or Pharisee or fisherman, we were all baptized by the same Spirit into the same Christ by the power of the same gospel. And therefore, we are one body. Each of us whom the Lord has saved has been incorporated into the greater company of believers we witness in the New Testament. We share in the same spirit that indwells the Peters and the Pauls and the Johns and the James and the Stevens and the Barnabases of the past. The same company of believers over the last 2,000 years that cling, they clung to the, the truth of the gospel, clinging to it, some of them to their very last breath. And the same spirit indwells each of us today in the church today. And so when we speak of unity, we need to begin there. We need to understand that and appreciate that to each of us belong the same Christ. No matter our backgrounds, areas of giftedness, personal history, our age or vocation, no matter how much or how little money we make, it doesn't matter. We've all tasted, if you are a part of the church through faith in Christ, we've all tasted the Lord's grace and forgiveness and have been baptized by one spirit, by one baptizer, Jesus Christ, into his body, into his church. And the metaphor Paul uses to describe that, to describe the church that we are all a part of through his Holy Spirit is that of the human body. Very interesting to use such a metaphor, this diversity within the unity of body of Christ. He uses that word picture of, of a body, the human body, verses 14 to 17. Now interestingly enough, every single one of us sitting here today has that. What is it? A human body. If you are sitting here today and you currently do not have a human body, you might want to get that looked at immediately. Now some of us have more miles on our bodies. Some of us have bodies that are breaking down physically. Some of us may not even have yet hit the 100 kilometer mile or the 100 mile mark yet in our, in our bodies. But each of us has a body. It's a pretty easy illustration to identify with, to understand. The human body, of course, is so complex. It's a fascinating piece of engineering, really. Made up of vastly different parts. Some appreciated more than others. Some parts of our bodies we take for granted until it all begins to break down. Some of you know that I have severe osteoarthritis in my big toe. I prefer to refer to it by its technical term, the grand toe. That's just very elegant, my grand toe. And I'm just going to require surgery in the next couple. I keep kind of kicking the can down the road because it will require me to be off my feet for a, quite a period of time. But I'll tell you, I never really appreciated my big toe until I couldn't really use it anymore. And every step I take, at times, it can be crippling, the pain. Some of you who have severe arthritis or other ailments could identify with that. We take 
for granted our bodies, especially in our youth when we're invincible. But you know, things begin to break down. That's just the nature of the human body. But all those unique body parts, including the toe, serve an important function to the whole, a common function, the well-being of the human body. Without the diversity of our human bodies, we wouldn't have the bodies we have right now. You'd, you'd have, Paul says, one gigantic organ walking around in verses 18 to 21. And people say the Apostle Paul didn't have a sense of humor. I could just picture him writing that led by the Spirit, kind of giggling to himself. A big brain walking around. A bunch of brains, I'll say this. This, this would be the challenge if if all we had was one gigantic organ. You'd have a bunch of brains trying to explain the nuances of the human experience without a mouth to a heart that can't hear what they're all saying anyways because it's got no ears, so it's deaf. That's the breakdown. As important as each of those organs are, the brain, the heart, the ears, the mouth, without one another, they're unable to be effective in anything. They can't do anything. And that's the point the Apostle Paul is making, that each organ in the human body is critical to the needs of the others functioning to their fullest capacity. They are interdependent. Together they achieve the optimal, they achieve the optimal results of robust and quality of life if they did work together interdependently. They can't function independently of one another. It's unhealthy. One organ can't support the life of the whole body. The eye, Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And that's where the Corinthians were struggling. There were a bunch of divided body parts when it should have been a united body of believers. Some of the examples, some of the areas it was divided over was leadership. The Corinthians, it was the Corinthian church themselves, the, the, the folks there, the believers there, who manufactured a leadership conflict and a resulting crisis. They were setting up these camps between Paul's leadership and Apollos's. You can read about that in uh, chapter 3, uh, chapter 1 there. What the churches called to, what they fa really failed to forget, what they, what they failed to recall, what they... What they had forgotten was that the church is called to be united under one shepherd, one Lord, one Savior, one King. And the Corinthians failed to be united under the perfect leadership of Jesus. They were, my emphasis over the last few weeks, they were divided in the gifts they had, the, the positions they had been given in the church by the Lord. Paul addresses that in chapters 13 and 14. Some were unhappy with the gifts that they had. Some overemphasized their gifts. And we have that today, that there are some who claim if you don't have all the gifts of the Spirit, somehow you, you're lacking in your salvific experience. That's hogwash. That's a lie. If you want to measure your salvation, you want to measure your growth, you go to the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Measure yourself against that list, not the list of gifts. Gifts are unique. It seemed like there were a lot of people in the church who were envious. They wanted somebody else's gift. I can be guilty of that at times when I hear people singing and playing a guitar. Boy, I'd love that gift. Oh, I shouldn't say that. There were some people who believed their gifting was unimportant. Maybe they felt their gifting was insignificant. So why even participate? You had feet trying to be hands, an eye trying to be an ear, a brain trying to be the heart. And with all that envy and selfishness and discontent, it was manifesting itself and it all led to an unhealthy body of believers. They wrote Paul a letter. They had a lot of questions. They were struggling, and Paul is answering, and this is one of the questions they had. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, chapter 12, this chapter, verse 1. And I'll tell you this, an unhealthy body of believers cannot be used by the Lord to its fullest. So Paul reminds them that all those gifts they did possess, the brains doing what it was meant to do, 
The eyes functioning the way they're supposed to. The heart doing what it was meant to do. Was a testimony to the Lord's sovereignty. His headship. When we begin to question our spiritual gifts and our position in the church and begin to believe that the gifts we possess are unimportant or insignificant or become envious of others, you know what we're really doing? You know what we're guilty of when we begin to think that way? In the midst of all that self-doubt or envy or jealousy, this is what we're doing. We are questioning God's wisdom and we are challenging his authority we are actively disobeying God's plan and purpose for each of us to minister within the office that he has gifted us when one of us for example holds back our gifts for whatever reason pride envy Jealousy, discontent, thoughts of unimportance, whatever the reason is, when we hold back those gifts he has clearly equipped us, for whatever reason, we are directly disobeying the Lord of our salvation. You are actively rebelling against the head of the church, Jesus Christ. You are living in rebellion. I hope you can receive that in love. It's very convicting to my heart. And it may, of course, while it hurts the Lord's heart most, which is a tragedy in of itself, it directly impacts the health and the well-being of the rest of the body, the rest of the church. It's affecting her ability to minister to one another and to the world. By not using your time and your talents and your tithes in the way God has directed you, you are personally crippling the body. You're robbing the body of some element and you have some gift that this body needs. And and just to compound that, You are running the risk of whatever gifting you have been blessed with by the Lord, you risk it being removed, furthering the damage to the local assembly. Take a moment to look around you, because I see all your faces from up here. And by the way, I do know who's napping, and that's okay. But look around you for a moment. Like really, turn your heads and look around you and see all your brethren and all your sisters in the Lord. If you are not serving with that gift you now possess, you are hurting those you just looked at. It's very convicting for me. I remember when the Lord led me into public ministry and I I kicked against the goats. I fought tooth and nail. I made every excuse. I'm slow of tongue and this and that and I did a great Moses impression and no, 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 no. It was the elders at our old chapel that really encouraged me and challenged me and reminded me that as, as, despite the, the seemingly ins- insignificant and small size of our, our old chapel, one elder in particular said, you're needed here. And you're robbing us of that gift that God gave you. Never forget that. Never forget that season when I held back and how I was living in rebellion and and hurting the people that I was worshiping with, crippling the body. It has been said that, quote, a Christian who does not have a ministry is a contradiction. He is disobedient and denies God the right to use him or her, of course, in the way he intends and for which he has gifted him. When we refuse to follow God's will and God's plan, we deny his authority and lordship, as well as his wisdom and his goodness, end quote. 
we need to be quick to remind ourselves that it is the Lord who has placed each of us in his body exactly where he wants us to be, to do exactly what he wants us to do. And each of us has a purpose in the local assembly, whether you feel like it or not. I think it's Ben Shapiro who says, facts don't care about your feelings. The Bible is not built upon our feelings. This is God's word, and God's word, he says, the Lord says, uh, as, he, as he goes on in verse, uh, for example, verse 27 and 28, now you are Christ's body, individually members of it, and here in verse 28, and God has appointed in the church first. It is the Lord who has arranged the church body with its giftedness in the same way he has arranged our human bodies at creation. And so it's he who has placed us in the body with a specific gift at a specific time to do exactly what he wants us to do. Verses 22 and 26, Paul warns against the thought that you don't need other believers. You know, pastors, you know what we need? We need prayer warriors. We need sons of encouragements. We need our Barnabases. Elders need Words of life spoken into them, and and they need words of encouragement as well. Sunday school teachers need need to be thanked for their service as they sacrifice every week to be with the children. Each believer needs the other in the same ways. And so on the list goes. Even the seemingly independent and individualistic Apostle Paul he still needed the support and company of other believers. Paul needed Barnabas. He needed Silas. He needed Dr. Luke. He needed Mark, even. Each ministering and encouraging in their lives intertwined with one another as they were on the road preaching the gospel in those early, early years of the good news. Paul also deeply felt the responsibility, having been gifted himself as an apostle, to minister to the Romans and needed the fellowship and the spiritual gifting that the Romans offered him, whom he desperately wanted to see, Romans chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. Paul knew that he needed God, of course. There's no debate there. But he also realized he needed other believers. My question is, do you? When we came out of COVID, there are still people who will not attend a church publicly, who have forsaken the assembling of the saints, have never recovered from those two years. But we need other believers. We need to minister to one another. We need to exercise our gifts for the good of the body, for the glory of Christ. John Wesley described it this way, quote, there is no such thing as a solitary Christian, end quote. I oftentimes use the the term a lone ranger Christian. There is no such thing. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. We need one another to help live effectively as God's people in this world and to minister the light of the gospel in dark places. It's been said that the church has all the spiritual carpenters and electricians and painters, and engineers, and plumbers it needs to build the house of God. But they need each other to build successfully. A plumber is not going to paint as effectively as a painter. A painter is not going to run electrical wiring as well as an electrician. So on and so forth, the metaphor goes. And so Paul establishes the interdependency of the body. Now, Once you've been reasonably, once you're reasonably sure of how you have been gifted, because everything we need in this church to function effectively, Christ has provided. You heard me say that a couple of weeks ago. Christ has provided it in this assembly. And once you are sure where you are gifted, you need to find an outlet for that service, verses 26 to 30. Now, Paul gives a a list here, a short list of apostles, prophets, teachers, gifts of healing, helps, administration, gift of languages. He gives other lists elsewhere, of course. But you need to find where God has gifted you. 
Oftentimes, it will be reflected in your interests and your strengths again, but that's where God has gifted you. Now, whether it's at a small group Bible study level or as a, as a, as a worship, as a song leader, lending your musical talents to lead corporate singing, or as a prayer warrior, you have a gift. You have a calling. You have a responsibility before your God to whom you will give an account to for how you used your time, your talents, and your tithes. Now, I want to encourage you I want to encourage you because that's what Paul's doing here. He isn't trying to guilt the Corinthians into service. That's not what I'm doing. Guilt's a poor motivator. It doesn't work. It might get a, an initial influx of, 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 of an impact, but it doesn't sustain long term. So it's not guilt. What, he, what he's trying to do, what I'm trying to do by reflecting the words of the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul here is to affirm the truth that it's God himself who has placed each and every individual believer within the body of Christ, and it was an act of his sovereignty. And another example of how the Lord provides and equips the local church. In the same way he provided for the children of Israel as they marched through the wilderness, he provides for the church here as we march through the spiritual wilderness on this side of glory. He has equipped you. He's equipped me. And we have to remind ourselves that there's, there's a real blessing in being used by him effectively within that office of your gift to minister to your fellow brothers and sisters, to use those gifts in love to the glory of God. Always remember, the Christian walk is not a spectator sport. We have to dump this spiritual apathy in North America, that Christianity is simply something to be consumed. It isn't a model of consumerism. That's not life in the church. It is living. It's dynamic. You've heard me use those words before. It's, inter, it's an intertwined life that glorifies God. I'm going to say something in love. The days of pew warmers are over. There are not going to be pew warmers at GBC. I have no authority in other churches, but the day of pew warming is over. In these days, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. We can't just go to church on Sunday anymore. Each and every one of us has a role to fill. You know, someone... Oh, I don't want to... Okay, well, I pointed to Angela's seat, so you'll probably figure it out. But Angela shared this wonderful idea with me. And she said, I know you're the kind of guy who would do it. So I'm going to give you a warning. If you're 65 and older, I've got work for you. I've got some heavy lifting for you. It's spiritual heavy lifting. And you can hold me to this. And if I don't provide this work for you, you come and you knock on my door, you phone me, you text me and say, hey, Pastor Bobby, where was that work you promised us? 60, who's 65 and older? Put your hand up. I already know who you are. I'll see you soon. Because physically you might say, well, you know what, I can't carry chairs and I can't, and I can't preach and I can't play a guitar. And I, Okay, that's fine. But you know what you can do? You can pray. And I'm going to give you a prayer list as long as I am tall. And you're going to pray and you're going to pray, and you're going to pray, and that's your good service. You may say, well, I'm not gifted in prayer. You know what? We can all pray. We can all pray. We're all gifted in that. We have a common gifting there. But some of you are gifted in just being a prayer warrior. And so I want to encourage you that when you receive that list, you hold me to it. I mean that. That you pray and you exercise that gift. You have a role to play here at Glenridge Bible Church. It's been said, what are the resources of Glenridge Bible Church? Our building. We have an incredible facility God has blessed us with. And number two, her people. Those are our resources, practically speaking. And so every one of us here, every single one of you, from the youngest to the not so young, 
Each of us is responsible to the Lord of our salvation to be at the center of God's activities in this church and be accountable to one another. You know what I'm gonna challenge you with? Take ownership of this ministry at Glenridge Bible Church. Take ownership of it. Now I touched on this briefly last week, but you might have been led to believe in your own life, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, but whatever gifting you have, you may have been, you may have been led to believe is insignificant. That compared to the speaking gifts or the public gifts, your gift is unimportant. You, you marginalize it somehow. But when you begin to understand and apply the metaphor of this body, this, this picture to the church yourself, you can see that each and every organ serves an important function, regardless of any negative thought you might have. The gifts we might be tempted to dismiss, the gifts we might be tempted to consider less valuable, the gifts we are tempted to consider less powerful or, or honorable, or in fact, Paul argues the more valuable gifts, more valuable than you might realize. If you are a big toe, I have a great and deep appreciation for you. You are important. So following Paul's line of thinking, the true value of a particular gift is often inversely proportional to its outward appearance. It's usually the opposite of what we think. The less honorable parts, like those fingers or those toes, as I've mentioned, or eyes and ears, need to be affirmed as being as valuable, though they function in a very different way, as valuable as the brain and as the heart. The Corinthians were being exhorted to bring a more balanced perspective to each believer's gifts. Those who were over-exalting themselves, and there, are, there are, I've encountered men like this, where they just simply over-exalt themselves and their gifting under a false pretense of humility. But there were those who over-exalted themselves in the first century, and there continue to be in the church today. Those with the more visible and dramatic gifts, those men, those individuals, you know what Paul says to them? Practice a little more humility. Be a little more humble. Exercise your gifts in love. And those who have the so-called unassuming gifts, they should be valued and treasured and encouraged. So how do we close this section out? Well, we need to relearn what servant leadership really looks like. Allow ourselves to spend time doing what we're good at, where God has gifted us. Be intimately involved with Glenridge Bible Church. Be involved with the believers here. Look beyond ourselves. Identify those areas you can contribute, where we can contribute to the overall health of the church on a consistent basis. Ask yourself this question. What can I do for the church at Glenridge? What can I do for the church at Glenridge? And as a leadership, it's our responsibility as under shepherds to direct you, to encourage you, to equip you. And that's what each of us has to do. What can I do for the church, for the health of this body? Where has God gifted me? Am I a toe? Am I an eye? Am I a hand? Am I a brain? What am I? And ask the Lord to reveal that to you. And then you know what you need to do? Pull up your sleeves and start working with the rest of us. We'd love it. We'd love it. Find out where you're uniquely gifted at. I want Glenridge Bible Church to be abnormal. I want us to be strange. Because in most North American churches, it doesn't matter if you have 10 people, 100 people, or 10,000 people. The, as pastors, as leadership, we see what we see. It's always ten, the same 10% that do all the work. As your pastor, it's 100%. We're all going to work together. Amen? Amen? Let's do it. Let's do it. So whether you're the eyes, the ears, the brain, the heart, the big toe, I keep talking about the big toe. It must have been really hurting the day I wrote this sermon. Be satisfied with that. Because that's exactly where the Lord has placed you. That's where he's gifted you. 
Your Savior has gifted you that gift for his bride. And be reminded, this was very sobering when this elder reminded me of withholding my own gift, as foolish as it is, that being preaching. I said, Bobby, you're saved, so you're not, you're not going to stand before the great white throne judgment. That's reserved for the unbeliever, for those who have rejected the gospel. But you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will. And everything we have done, whether good or bad, whether genuine or selfishly, that's all going to be revealed. And we will be recompensated for the deeds we have done in the body in glory. So how we use our gifts, loved ones. How you view others, how you view their gifts, your attitudes, our attitudes, my attitude toward the ministry of those gifts will be scrutinized under the eye of the one who gave us those gifts, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we find this message, this portion of text challenging, if we're truly honest. It's much easier to simply come to church and to remain in the pews and just to listen to the, the preacher and to enjoy the music and just return to the, the regular uh, uh, daily things of life. But Lord, you have gifted us in some incredible ways. I want to pray for the heart this morning that knows you as their savior, but has been holding back for whatever reason that might be. I pray that you, as you build the unity of the saints here at Glen Ridge Bible Church, that you continue to equip us, continue to reveal to us these areas of gifts that you yourself have given to us through your Holy Spirit. And that we would be blessed to use them, to minister them, to be an encouragement to those around us, to the glory of Christ. We thank you for this very challenging epistle, this, this first Corinthians. It challenges our apathy, it challenges our indifference, it challenges our sense of insignificance at times. That we all have a role to play, but in humility, we step forward to use those gifts. And so we pray now that you would continue to bless this body, continue to rise, uh, raise up those who have particular gifts, where there might be a need, and instead of complaining, recognizing that they have the ability to actually address that very concern, Lord, help us to be united in this body with Christ as our head, and for his glory, we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. This morning, let's close our service by turning to hymn number 283. 283, We Are God's People. We'll stand to sing, please. Slur.
So yesterday at the fishing derby, I think, was a great example of the interconnectedness of the body there. You had Rick and Stan, who are, who are fishermen and men's men, and Stan's cutting worms and putting them on the hooks. Thank you for doing that, Stan, because I would not do that. You had Rick, who was willing to go down and grab hooks out of the water and, and uh, get right into the, the nitty-gritty of things. You, you had guys like Jim and Gerald there encouraging, just cheering the kids on, and then me sitting under the canopy eating Tim Hortons. It was great. Like, it was the perfect function. You could see that body working dynamically together. You know what? This message was to encourage you, to encourage you. Because, you know, there are men who serve here that if I was them, I'd be in a retirement home watching reruns of Price is Right because it was better when Bob Barker was on there anyways. That's just me. If I was at that age... But they're here serving, here loving this body of Christ, loving this body of believers, and, and I know that they are blessed by it. I am blessed by using my gifts to minister to others, and you have a gift, and so I'm encouraging you. You find what that is, and you use it here, and you bless somebody around you, because you know what? The Lord would be so pleased, so pleased to see that happen. And just because it's July and August, we kind of like to let our hair down. It's summertime. We want to put our feet up. Sure, you can rest, but there's still work to do. There's still a ministry at Glenridge. And we're going full steam ahead into the new school year that's coming up soon. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you again for this time that we can be here together as the church. We thank you for the fellowship and the unity we have in Christ Jesus and through your spirit. We thank you for the gifts that you've blessed each and every one of us with. We just pray that you, that the, if there are those who don't know what those gifts are, you would reveal them, make it clear to them, and that they would minister unto your glory and for the edification of the saints. We thank you for this temple, for this body, for this, and all the metaphors, all the pictures that remind us just how intertwined we, our lives really are in Christ Jesus. And until that upward call, or Christ calls us home, Lord, use us, we pray, to the fullness and effectiveness of the ministry you've called us forth to. For the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, we pray these things in his name. Take us in peace. Amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.